My name is Robert Hall. I am. Um, uh, how far back do you want to go? Like from the day I was born. Did you have a pink rat as a child? I did actually. There you go. And then I did. Start there. And then I and then I delivered milk and cream, and then I went on to do like work in the kennels. Then I got interested in cancer research. Actually, this was in the days of before BRCA one. So actually, was I was one of the groups trying to find BRCA one. Obviously, we didn't get the, we didn't get the prize. Uh, but I really enjoyed you know molecular genetics at that point. So. I went to do a PhD in genetics at Nottingham University. From there, I did a postdoc in Japan, studying yeast gene expression. I came to Canada, started working with a guy called Charlie Boone on looking at synthetic lethality screens in the yeast. I did some proteomics in Jack Greenblatt's lab, also at U of T, and then I moved over to do bioinformatics with a guy called Chris Hogue. And that's where I really got into data curation and managing um, the project involving uh, the kind of recuration of pathways at a database at Science Magazine, uh, which is the database of cell signaling. And um, from there, I uh, moved through other bioinformatic roles. I managed the limbs at one point, setting up for a cancer research uh, study. And then now where I'm at, I'm at uh, the OICR, working with a guy called Lincoln Stein. Uh, and I, I do the outreach and management for uh, Reactome. So, I will talk a little bit about Reactome today. We'll demonstrate that in the lab uh, later on in the morning. But I think I kind of want to follow along a little bit from Yuri's talk and some of the stuff that Veronique's introduced you in Cytoscape and talk a little bit more depth about pathway and network analysis. So your learning objectives obviously today is to understand more about the approaches of the analysis. I do apologize if I'm kind of repeating some of the things that Yuri said. Um, but I think it helps to reinforce some of the approaches that actually that, that not only have I, but also Yuri's found useful. Um, I want you to understand the different sources of pathway network information. I think there's some important points to raise there, because um, for all the analytical approaches that you apply, you need to understand not only your own data, but where the data you're trying to integrate it comes from. And that actually can sometimes influence your results. And so you have to be aware of that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the analytical approaches. I won't give you a ton of stats stuff. I'll leave that down to Quaid, who's going to be here a bit later. And I think Yuri might have actually introduced some of the, the enrichment approaches earlier. Uh, and then we'll do the Reactome FI network. Uh, we'll use that in the lab. Sorry? Yes, the Reactome FI, which is Reactome Functional Interaction Network. So we will we will talk about that later. So. To me, what is pathway or network analysis? Um, essentially, it's a computational technique that makes use of biological pathway or network information to gain an insight into a biological system. It could be a normal cell, it could be a disease state, it could be a phenotype, whatever you're studying. Um, I say it's a rapidly evolving field, and it is because, um, well, there's something called next generation sequencing, and that has generated huge, large, complex data sets out there. And um, I would say that um, with that, there has to be tools to analyze that data. And I think pathways and network analysis are good approaches. Um, there are many different approaches to talk about. I, I could spend hours talking to you about all the different ones. I'm probably going to talk about the ones that are most relevant, uh, hopefully to some of the work that you're doing. So um, one of the challenges, I think, that lies um, when you are working with, like, gener you know, when we're working with experiments where they're generating huge amounts of data, is to extract from that meaningful information. You can have millions, if not billions, of data points, and you want to answer a fundamental biological question. So, pathway analysis basically incorporates um, a lot of priority knowledge, um, and it helps you to analyze these large gene, protein, metabolite data sets that you have and puts it into a biological context. Um, the method itself, because there's so many different, you know, it increases the statistical power uh, by integrating multiple perturbations for testing across a high dimensional space. Um, particularly with uh, cancer research now, next generation sequencing, we're identifying a lot of somatic mutations. Um, we know, you know, what the, you know, we're trying to figure out what the role of these driver mutations are. But you have this whole long 
tail of like smaller number of rare mutations that you find in your data sets. The question is how can we use pathways and networks to help explain the relationships between those genes? So just as an example here, um, the most cited reason for actually performing pathway analysis is to help analyze a gene list. So here's a gene list, 127 cancer driver genes. So this was, this was a data set derived from the Cancer Genome Atlas, um, which, which you know, these researchers classified as cancer driver genes based on their mutation frequency. Now, when you look at that list of 127 genes, you'll probably identify one or two genes that you know about, but you don't know many of them. The question is, what's that list actually represent? What are the mutations doing to cause cancer? And so what pathway databases allow us is to map these genes onto biological pathways and understand the roles in the pathway. Um, and I'll show some of the analytical techniques that we can use, and I'll apply that same 20, 127 gene list later. Um, I apologize for this slide. I'm not sure if this is a format <coughs> issue, but I wanted to take a moment to talk about what a map pathway is and what a network is. Um, I think that's for some of you could be kind of self-explanatory, but there's certain things and principles to be aware of when you're talking about. So a biological pathway is a series of actions um, among molecules in the cell that leads to a certain product or a change in a cellular state. Um, and with that, you have different categories of different types of pathways. And we still use these terms quite frequently, and some of the tools that I'm going to talk about will only work on certain data sets. Sorry, will only work on certain types of pathways. So you can't apply the tools to every single data set. Uh, so there's metabolic pathways, which you know, everybody's kind of familiar with glycolysis, one of the first pathways you learned at high school. Did everyone actually do? Everyone did biology here? <laughs> you're, qu you're quiet. <laughs> But obviously the most important, uh, I think, is signal transduction pathways, where we have a signal that moves from outside the exterior of the cell into a uh, transcription factor within the nucleus. And then from there you can have gene expression profiles as well. And that falls into gene regulatory pathways, where you have genes turning on and off. So they're the three kind of categories. And certain databases I'm going to talk about will curate different levels of information. Now, as for a network, um, to be honest, most pathways do not necessarily start at an endpoint, and I have an endpoint. Now on the diagram on the left, when I'm using my finger, I should use a pointer, you see the EGFR signaling pathway. You can see there's a start point here, and there's an endpoint down here. You don't see that same thing with the network, okay? Um, and in fact, many pathways in the cell don't really have boundaries. We just artificially create those boundaries when we curate databases, or when we put an illustration up there. So, and then, so because multiple pathways interact with one another, and they ultimately form. And researchers are able to earn, learn a lot about human disease uh, from studying a variety of different biological pathways and networks, um, identifying what the genes are, the relationships between these genes and other molecules involved in the pathway or the network, and probably find clues to when something does go wrong in the disease. Um, it used to be that I would talk about a lot of different pathway databases, but the landscape of these data resources has changed. So I'm only going to focus on what call reaction network databases. So this is like Reactome. Uh, has any, who's heard of KEG? Okay, KEG. Okay, that's good. Uh, Panther. Okay, uh, Wiki, Wiki Pathways. Okay, so basically they explicitly describe biological processes as a safe series of biochemical reactions. And the flexibility of that data model allows you to describe almost any type of reaction in the cell, whether it's metabolic, signaling, or gene regulation. So you have a series of inputs flowing into the reaction and a series of outputs. Then those outputs become the inputs for subsequent reactions. And then you get a pathway. And the different types of molecules that you can have you know, represent the inputs. And you can see in brackets we're using reference databases to annotate these molecules. So you're explicitly describing those molecules within the database. And that allows you to basically uh, connect your data to a particular molecule in that database. We also use a variety of gene ontology terms to describe the catalytic activity, say for example of an enzyme, or if there's a regulatory process, we can describe it as a biological process. These reactions, sorry, question, yes? The overlap in terms of the content? Um, good question. Um, I would say, uh, I, do, I do have to kind of just uh, um, 
advise you that I, since I do work for Reactome, I do have a slight bias towards Reactome, but I have looked at all the different pathway databases out there. And for the time, Keg used to have, now I'm looking at it from a human gene component, but um, Keg used to have the largest collection of uh, human annotations, linking human proteins or genes to pathways. I would say Reactome's taken the lead now. And Reactome is probably one of the few pathway databases, and I'll talk about this in a minute, that's still actively curating pathways. A lot of data resources have kind of gone stagnant. So in terms of coverage, we cover about half the known human genome. So you can get a sense that KEG's less than that. And when you actually try to overlap the resources to actually identify um, different pathways, there's not that many. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But, but keg historically has been more bacteria. Uh, it, it has, and that's the thing with keg, yeah. I mean, keg, yeah, in fact, I'm moving on to the next slide, so it's really going to introduce keg now. So it is a collection of biological information. It's not just about pathways, it's genes, genomes across multiple species. But I would say, as Francis was saying, it focused mostly on, on the kind of the supermodel organisms that you had out there. And they have kind of these reference pathways which may not necessarily truly reflect all the pa a given pathway within a particular organism. It's just a reference. So the, the pathway has been curated from a variety of different data sources. So they have this kind of reference pathway. And then they kind of, based on uh, orthology information, they can project that pathway into many other different species. Now, Reactum does a similar thing. I'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, the point is, Reactum doesn't project into as many organisms. We curate human pathways. Keg curates human, bacterial, anything and everything. It is a useful resource. Um, the only thing is, I would point out, is that it's licensed now. So in order to get into the real heart of the data, you actually have to purchase a license to get access to the data. You can still access data through their website for free, but really for bioinformaticians, they want access to the, the flat files and things like that. Um, so this is just a Keg diagram here. Um, green boxes represent proteins, white boxes represent um, genes. You have these kind of encapsulated pathways. So these are pathways within pathways. And then you have a variety of different lines connecting the, the entities. Yes? It, it is, but, to, but it's a lower throughput. It's not the capacity, their curation capacity has been reduced. So they're not, um, they're still adding. Uh, new pathways, but I would say the only resource that's actively adding new pathways to their resource is Reactome and Wiki Pathways. And just to point out that Wiki Pathways actually contains a subset of Reactome data as well. Um, so Reactome, um, in difference to Keg, we're open source, open access. All of the data, websites, all the data sets we generate are open source, open access. We focus on the curation of human pathways and encompassing all areas of, of uh, pathways, you know, metabolism, signaling, and other biological processes like the cell cycle and so forth. Every, every pathway is traceable back to the primary literature. You can make the same comments about Wiki Pathways and KEG. And like all other databases, we extensively cross-reference to other databases or data resources so that um, you can find about, you know, if you identify a gene that you, you know in a study, you don't you understand it's in a pathway, but you don't know much more about it. You can click to a whole host of NCBI and EBI based resources, and then we provide tools for data analysis and visualization. Not all pathway resources do that. Some people just provide you with the data, and it's up to you to use the tools. We do a little bit of both, and we can actually have a situation like this where uh, this is the Reactome Pathway Browser, and with that you have uh, this is a pathway diagram here at the top. Um, on the left here is the hi pathway hierarchy. You can interact with it and select different pathways. The additional numbers, numerical numbers you're seeing here in this you know, list of significant pathways is the re result of a pathway enrichment analysis. Again, taking that 127 cancer genes that I talked about earlier, plugging that into and overlaying that data on top of the, the reactome pathway diagrams. So it's very easy to do. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about file formatting in the lab, but simply it could just be a list of genes, it could be a gene expression data set, um, it could be a list of proteins or even metabolites. So rather than thinking along with like doing gene enrichment analysis, you could do 
um, a chemical enrichment analysis. So if you had a, a list of small molecules, you could do that with Reactyl. In fact, if you had a, a list of mixed molecules, you could do that type of analysis as well. The one thing I do kind of want to point out with different data resources is the slight difference in our approach. Sorry, question, yes. Yeah, so given the overlap between different calculations and the how would you know which Like one signal from your actual input signal. So you you have like if there's overlap in the genes contained in each yeah. way, you could theoretically have multiple patterns. Yes, you, you could. See so, so see you had a handful of genes and the components are part of like a signaling component, but you actually realize that's the downstream component of the pathway and something like EGFR, FGFR, yeah. some of the receptor tyrosine kinase signaling pathways are going to contain that same subset of Genes. Yes, that's always going to be the challenge. Um, we'll learn about this a bit in the, the lab later. You, you do have to kind of do a little bit of exploratory analysis on that list to see what those hits really are. And I think, you know, what we do with the tools is that if you can incorporate different data, res you know, pathways from different data resources and you're seeing the same kind of hits, it's kind of pushing you a little bit towards this particular subset of pathways. These particular, you know, this is what this, these genes reflect. And you can tease out from the data set, sorry, the results, you know, pathways, significant pathways. It is feasible. Um, so this was just to show a difference between reactome and keg. So at the top here, we're just showing uh, a reaction uh, from apoptosis. Uh, and this is the corresponding keg diagram here. And the arrow just wants to highlight that um, you'll see a difference. So the CAG has annotated this reaction like this caspase 8 and 10. Um, so basically caspase 8 and 10 activates BID. Um, but they don't actually provide any mechanism. You can see how there's, there's no, seems to be no real, well there is a, obviously a relationship between caspase 10 and BID, but caspase 8 just kind of sits there. and It's not clear what the relationship is between 8 and 10. So with Reactome, we actually mechanistically demonstrate that you know active caspase 8 here and we also have, with it because it's actually a complex, we're actually explaining that this here is realistically a complex. So the point is, we have different approaches to visualize data and how we annotate information. So it can make it sometimes difficult to compare one database with another. But if you kind of simplistically break it down to like the elements of genes and proteins, it's much simpler to just look at the overall coverage. You know, keg apoptosis pathway has 10 genes in it, say for example, and the reactome pathway has the same 10 genes. We just might organize that different, the information slightly differently. So a good resource to get access to um, uh, not just pathway but also uh, network information is uh, Pathway Commons. So basically all these different pathway databases are out there and we're all curating, or, and, and uh, this network, this interaction databases, they're all curating different data sets. And so a resource like Pathway Commons tries to aggregate all that data together and provide you with tools. Uh, to actually visualize and analyze your data. So it's a key resource to getting access to a lot of pathway data sets in a, in a kind of unified format. So that's one thing you've got to think about when you're doing your analysis. Where is my source of data coming from? Well, you know where your experimental data is coming from, but the network, the pathway and network information, where is it coming from? And how am I going to integrate the two data sets, my data with what's already known? And so this is what Pathway Commons tries to do. It gives you that data in a particular format, that you can use with a tool like Cytoscape. Okay, and I'll talk a bit more about those formats in a minute. Um, so here's a moment just to explain what an interaction network is. Um, essentially, it's a collection of nodes, or sometimes people use, still use the term vertices. I prefer using nodes and edges. The edges are the lines that connect two nodes in this example here. And there's a whole different other series of terms that we use, directed, undirected, Basically, that tells you, you know, this arrow has direction. So this molecule here, this node, is having some influence on this. So there's some directionality to that. If it was just a straight line, you wouldn't know whether this node is regulating this node. It just, you just know that there's some relationship between those two nodes. Um, nodes can represent many different types of molecules. Um, it can, you know, any type of object. By far the most common is protein-protein interactions or gene-gene interactions. 
but um, in the next slide I'll show you some other examples. And the edges themselves can be based, you know, any types of relationship, whether they're physical interactions, whether they participate in the same complex, they're regulators, they're part of the same reaction. It's almost, again, and in fact, unfortunately in the next example I can show where things, you know, can kind of twist. Things that you would expect to be nodes can actually be reflected as edges. So, um, so the kind of me methods that we use to uh, the experimental methods that we use to discuss, you know, to look at protein-protein interactions, it could be things like yeast two hybrid experiments, uh, that could be mass spec, it could be individual experiments where people are doing biochemical. IPs. IPs and purifications. I mean, the good old days, you basically had a bucket full of cells and you'd pass them through tons of affinity columns and you'd hope to pull out some protein and you'd run it on a gel and then you'd cut the gel out and you'd try and do some mass spec to identify the protein. And maybe that was your complex. Now, with high throughput techniques, you can do a lot of things a lot faster. Um, now, in terms of identifying gene gene interactions, it's a little bit more subjective. I mean, in yeast, the experiments, you could, you could do synthetic. Excuse me, has anybody heard of synthetic lethality? Oh, so it's basically the idea is that um, in yeast, you can knock out one gene and it kills the cell. So that's an essential gene. But you can knock a gene out in a cell and it has no effect. And you can knock another gene out, gene B out, and it hasn't got an effect either. But by combining B and B, by knocking those both out, you can kill a cell, well, so it's, it's, and that's called synthetic lethality. So you can basically make the assumption, you don't necessarily know what the relationship, I mean, you know that there's a relationship between this gene A and gene B, but you know, there's probably other processes or physical interactions going on between them that you don't know about in the relationship. But you can at least make the assertion that gene A and gene B are somehow connected because, because you knock them both out of a cell and it kills the cell. So, um, um, so this is the different types of you know different types of interaction networks. There, it's an older slide, but it very high, you know, very clearly, you know, it's, I call them this, this, um, call them the supermodel organisms. I mean, essentially, just softly, you see elegans arabidopsis. These were the, the you know where people were identifying a variety of different protein-protein interaction networks in the early days. And then once you know people cloned all the genes in humans and they started putting in these two hybrids vectors, they could actually do mass screenings of protein-protein interactions. So you can get all these different types of networks that exist. So you've got transcriptional regulatory networks. So the actual, the nodes in this, there's two different types of nodes. Uh, the diamonds represent the transcription factors and then their targets are the, are the circles. You've got vi uh, virus host networks where you've got nodes representing uh, host, human host cell proteins, and then the other nodes are viruses. Metabolic networks, uh, you have actually um, enzymes as the nodes, and the lines themselves are actually the, met the metabolites, or the products of those, those uh, enzymes. Um, and then disease networks, and basically in this case, the, the diseases themselves are in fact the nodes, and the lines are the kind of genes, the, the mutations that connect those different diseases. But by far the most common is the protein-protein interaction networks, which we're going to use. Now, how do we get um, interaction data? Uh, so there's, again, a variety of different uh, interaction databases out there. Um, uh, I used to work for one called BIND, which is the Biomolecular Interaction Network Database. Uh, and actually, Francis, you, Francis and I used to work for that. Um, and in fact, at one point, it was probably the biggest interaction database out there. Now, I would say resources like Intact, Mint, Biogrid are probably other useful resources to get interaction data. Um, forgive me, I missed a slide. Sorry about that. So um, basically, uh, these network interaction databases, they can either be built because you're actually dealing with larger quantities of data uh, that derive from high throughput experiments, you can, shall we say, automatically curate that information into a database. But there is a kind of low throughput manual curation by individual people reading papers. Um, I would say there's more extensive coverage of a biological system. So you're going to find better coverage of you know, the genes or proteins within the cell um, 
than you will find in a pathway database. Um, although I would say that some of the relationships and underlying evidence is a little bit more tentative. With a pathway database, there's a lot more detail about the individual reactions. So you can understand the mechanistic relationships between the molecules. In the network database, or the net, you know, there's less information. You know, you know there's a relationship between two nodes, but you don't know as much information, I think. And then, as I said, the popular resources uh, here, BioGrid, Intact, and then there's Mint as well. They vary based on um, the types of interactions that they curate, whether they're physical or genetic, um, you know, the, the species they're covering. These are the popular ones that cut for uh, human, uh, curated human data. So in this slide, I was just showing you the intact. So everybody's, well, favorite gene. I, uh, there was a time when you would search for P53 and you used to get 10 papers in the world. That was it. My wife actually did uh, research on another, you know, sort of, Kind of, kind of famous gene called P10, and when she started her PhD, there was three papers on P10, two of which were actually cloning the gene. Nowadays, you can, you know, you search PubMed, you can find, you know, in this case, thousands of binary interactions. That's because TP53 has been cloned in many, many different organisms, um, and also TP53. Well, it's not just a, it's not just one gene; it's several genes now, and then there's also um, other genes with TP53 in the name that are related interactors. So you're going to find a whole host of interactions. Um, and typically what you've got is this kind of table of data. And you're going to see this binary interaction here. You're going to get supporting data. Um, and then you're going to see you know, cross references to other interaction databases. And then you can click on these records and you can get more information about the interaction, the source of that interaction. Uh, and you can potentially visualize that information although I'm not showing it in this slide. So um, now you know where data comes from. The question is, how do I integrate that into my, my workflow? So there's a variety of different open data exchange formats. So these are basically files that are made available so that uh, you can simply download you know, a lot of pathway network information in batch um, or for individual pathways or networks. And then you can use that as a sub, you know, you can feed that data into one of your tools like Scientescape or one of your other um, work pipelines. So there's, there's four types I'm going to talk a bit more about. Um, just now, there's SPGN. This is, this, is a stand, this is a systems biology graphical notation. So basically, it's a, a standardized format for um, showing, uh, representing, you know, biological processes, pathways, and interactions. And the idea here is with this file format is that you can you will see a particular pathway diagram. Nodes are organized in particular locations. When you download that file and then you upload that file into one of the, the editors or your analysis tool, you actually retain that same layout. That actually sounds kind of kind of like, well, wouldn't you expect that? But a lot of these other files, because it contains so much information, you don't necessarily want to keep the core of the information. So SVGN is very good if you want to actually use the diagram and kind of edit it yourself, add more information. But things like Biopax, SBML, and even Cyquic, um, a lot of the time when you upload that data into a network viewer, you're going to lose that pathway connectivity that you see in the React Home database. So Biopax is a standard language that aims to exchange and integrate data from not just pathways, but also data uh, for interaction uh, databases. Uh, Pathway Commons uses the Biopax format, so you can upload that data directly into Cytoscape, which I believe you learned about yesterday. So that's a good way of starting to bring data into Cytoscape so you can build your network, and then you can do the data analysis from there. So that's, in a sense, what I'm describing to you here is how you create one approach to doing network analysis is actually to, or pathway analysis, is to uh, create, the, create the network yourself because you have a choice of deciding what information what you want to include in the network. The other example is SciQuick. This is mostly for molecular interaction database. Uh, so there's a kind of, it's kind of like a tab delimited file, which, is in a, which basically allows you to upload again data into Cytoscape if you want. Um, and then SBML, if you're doing kind of, um, you know, looking at computer models of different pathways and networks, you might actually use this particular format just because you can actually include kinetic information. Um, certain databases like Reactive don't necessarily 
curate the kinetic data, but there's other resources like Biomodels, which actually has the relevant reaction kinetics that you might want to include into your analysis. So there's different formats. Uh, I'm telling you these are the most common ones to use, and they're probably the most relevant because there's different series of visualization tools that accept these data sets. Uh, so you actually introduced to Cytoscape uh, yesterday. You're going to use that later today. There is other tools. There's um, Navigator, uh, which is quite a powerful um, visualization tool for representing two and three-dimensional visualizations of biological networks. There's Visant, um, which really kind of works well with uh, metabolic networks. Um, there's things like for SPML, you could use some of the thing called Cell Designer. The, the point I'm making here is that a lot of these are open access, open source. Some network tools that were uh, developed in the early days, uh, sorry, that people used in the early days are licensed, so you actually have to buy them. So, um, or if you want to actually develop a tool for them, because some of these have plugins that allow you to expand the complement of analysis tools or to integrate additional data. Um, again, uh, you know, Cytoscape's a very good example where a lot of that tool development is open, but something like Cell Designer, there's actually a license which actually restricts you from actually integrating certain things into that tool. So you're actually, all that you can really use it for is data visualization and a little bit of analysis according to their framework. But something like Cytoscape, you know, if you're not happy with like the particular tool, you can actually develop it yourself and you can contribute to a kind of, uh, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the analysis field. So it's actually kind of a useful approach here to actually use tools like some of the ones here because um, there's a, it's not just you that's working on this, there's a whole community of people out there working on these tools. So you'll always find, you know, if I don't have the best way to, you know, if I'm not explaining to you that this is the right way to do your analysis, you can go and read papers, you can go to the Cytoscape website, you can, you can download apps, you can basically try all the different tools that are out there and seeing if they're better for your analysis than what I'm saying. So typically, I'm not sure if you already showed this, but this is a typical analysis workflow for, um, for either pathway or network analysis. Now I know this example is showing the word pathway, but you could, you could cross that out and rewrite network database. The, the approaches still apply. Um, typically, you have your data set. Could be a gene list, could be a gene expression profile data set, it could be results from mass spec. And you can fill, you know, protein list from mass spec experiment. You traditionally, the most, you know, frequently uh, is pathway enrichment analysis. And this is this first box here. And there's a statistical algorithm applied, and at the, bit, at the end of that output, you get essentially a list of significant pathways with a p-value or a q-value. That's typically the most common type of an analytical approach. Another approach is uh, called functional class scoring. Um, this is when you use a gene level statistic, and this was best popular. Were they introduced to gene set enrichment analysis, GSEA? So that is a functional class scoring example. And again, widely used uh, resources. And you'll find things like, you know, uh, you know, individual pathway database like Reactome are part of the gene sets that you'll find for GSEA. And then finally, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, and we'll try to demonstrate a little bit about this, and this is actually where you start taking on board some aspects of the network topology, so the actual structural layout of the pathway. You know, you're going to organize information into particular, in a particular, you know, you'll see a network, and then you'll find that, you know, when you actually integrate your data in, you apply a variety of different um, analytical algorithms, you can actually identify structures within that network that could actually tell you something meaningful about your data. So you have to look at things like um, simply, you know, more about the structure of the network. Um, and these are more kind of um, about understanding the perturbation that could be going on within a pathway. So if you perturb, sorry, if you perturb a pathway, there's an effect, whether that kills the cell or whether that treats, you know, you know, switches, you know, switches a pathway, inactivates a pathway. So these are things that you can do and study in uh, the pathway topology section. Uh, I'm probably not explaining this very well, but I will show you in future slides better examples of this. Um, so I don't know if you already put this slide up. This was a paper that you 
apologize again, that's getting cut off at the bottom here, but um, this is another way of looking at... He did? Yeah. Okay, so I wonder whether he's, he's actually put the same questions. So I was looking at it in a different way. Okay, so, all right. But this is it. I mean, the enrichment analysis can allow you to, you know, basically, and I'm, I admit that I work in, I work at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. A lot of the data that I've worked on in previous years has been cancer data sets. So I, I'm a little biased towards, when I'm giving talks, I will talk a bit more about cancer. The examples you're going to learn in the lab are cancer data sets. I have to say that probably the better sources of data out there, I mean, I know that there's other diseases. I know that some of you may actually be working on rarer diseases out there. And I think that's a valued effort. There's certainly, you know, but um, you can basically substitute the word cancer for pretty much any other kind of disease or other, you know, phenotype that you're studying. So I think the second one can help, you know, potentially identify. And we're going to learn about this in the lab, this whole de novo subnetwork construction. But you can basically ask questions like, are pathways particularly <coughs> identifying new pathways? Are they altered in cancer? And are there any kind of clinically relevant summer tumor subtypes? You know, the idea is linking or integrating not just your own data, your, you know, the experimental data that you have to actually identify significant pathways, components within the network, but also then to bring in clinical data to actually see if you can define differences in those tumor subtypes. You know, different types of pathways are being switched on or off. And then finally, um, which, you know, when you start looking at pathway-based modeling, which I was trying to explain a moment ago, you're looking at how pathway activities, the flow of information through a pathway changes, either in an individual patient or across multiple patients. And really, and the question is, are there any targetable pathways within a patient based on the, those observed changes? Now, there are some issues to kind of raise, some challenges about different types of analysis. Um, and which is why some people try to prefer network-based analysis, which is why I'm going to focus a bit more on that in the lab today. And that is we can address two issues uh, with pathway-based, you know, why we might use network analysis to, to, ha to deal with um, a couple of issues in pathway-based analysis. So um, pathways kind of have a hierarchical organization. And that is, you know, kind of like you were explaining the other day about gene ontology. At the very top, you could have the term pathway, and that covers all pathways. Then below that, you're going to have metabolic pathway. And then under metabolic pathway, you're going to have, you know, metabolism of proteins, metabolism of carbohydrates. And then under metabolism of carbohydrates, you're going to have glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, and all the other things. So there's a certain way that you organize those pathways, and that's how it has been for years. So... Um, that causes a little, you know, getting back to the question earlier, it does cause some issues when it comes down to data analysis. So you want to try and flatten that hierarchy down. So we can actually convert that the pathway information into a kind of systems-wide network, and that makes it much easier to analyze your data because there you've just got one big network. And the other thing to kind of bear in mind, which I alluded earlier, is pathways don't necessarily have boundaries. There's crosstalk. And we've just given you a nice little, you know, I could show a nice diagram of a pathway and say, this is the pathway for EGFR signaling, but we know that there's components in there that are shared with other receptor tyrosine kinase pathways. So where does that end? Because there's because you're going to find uh, that genes are going to exist in multiple pathways, but you're typically only going to see one gene in the network because it's one big display. And all kind of the crosstalk, the, the interactions relating to crosstalk are displayed in the same network, whereas you may not necessarily all see all those interactions uh, within a pathway diagram. So that's going to obviously affect your data analysis sometimes. The other challenge is, and I think this has always been the case, I think, you know, I used to work on, uh, actually Francis and I were talking about this the other day, I worked in uh, a lab in the very early days when you, when you're doing gene expression profiling, it was a it was a nitrocellulose membrane with individual genes spotted onto that onto that. Nowadays, it's all glass slides and microchips. But in those days, um, you know, the, the kind of complement of bioinformatics tools and databases you have nowadays didn't exist. So we were joking that the only way that you actually could analyze your data set was basically identify the genes that kept popping up in, in the experiment, 
and the frequency, and then you would cluster that information using Mike Lyson's. Thing. I can't remember the name of the tool. Was it Cluster or something like that? And it was basically just presenting a heat map of, of the data, which was, you know, for the longest time, quite a common format of displaying um, your data, your results. Obviously now, people like to show network diagrams and pathways. That's a better way to demonstrate. So, um, but the same problem then still exists. I've got different types of experiments that I'm doing. I've got gene expression. I've got somatic mutation data. I've got, um, you know, phosphorylation data. I've got mass spec information. How do I bring all that data together? Now, I'm not going to tell you every single thing can be done here. There's still some challenges out there, but you can at the very least integrate some data sets. And we're going to do that a little bit later um, in, the, in, the, in the React Home lab. And then the other thing to kind of still, and we're still trying to work out some of these, you know, these, these questions in terms of like doing these kind of <coughs> moving into that third category where you're actually doing pathway-based modeling or simulations. And that is how to use, you know, the structures that you identify within your network analysis. How can that actually be used to um, predict, you know, develop biomarkers, predict patient outcome and treatments. And then when you start perturbing these networks with drugs, because you think of people that are undergoing chemotherapy, you can analyze those, you know, you can, you can analyze the events that are going on, going on in the cell by, you know, gene expression profiling or next generation sequencing, is you can study how some of these drugs are having a, you know, how they're kind of potentially affecting individual pathways. That's a little bit more challenging, but, um, you know, it's, it's, you have to set some expectations, you know. Uh, you can, oh, sorry, the topologies of networks. So the, um, you know, I should actually have a better answer for this. Yes, you can. Um, and a colleague of mine, actually, if he was standing here, would probably have a better answer for you. It's not straightforward to actually, and, but you can do statistical testing to compare, um, we're going to talk about network modules in a moment, but you know, if you do have two networks, you can compare this. Um, and I think there's some tools inside Escape that allow you to do that as well, but I am not sure. But uh, I will, I will. I was going to ask Veronique. Sorry, I was going to kind of be. How do you compare two networks? I was thinking. How, I'm trying to. There's. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. It's more custom. It's it's feasible, but I I don't I, off the top of my head I don't have a simple example I can give you of like how best to do that. All right. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, network-based data analysis. Um, obviously now we're actually, you know, we have better coverage uh, because we, there's more information about particular human genes. Um, this is going to be focused mostly on protein-protein interaction networks. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, identifying these kind of topological structures, you know, the modules, or clusters within the networks. Um, we can talk about annotating those modules to identify uh, unique gene signatures or, you know, in some ways try to identify uh, biomarkers. Of course, um, with the advent of next generation sequencing, we're generating large data sets of uh, somatic mutations. We can look at driver and rare mutations together now. And using network approaches, you can understand the relationships between different driver genes and these rare mutations within the cell. Um, and rather than, um, you know, label them individual modules with pathway, well, we can, we can obviously label them with pathway annotations, but if we think that within that module there's a series of content of genes that are being mutated, you could think about labeling that module with, as a disease or, you know, a mutated pathway. And I'll talk, we'll talk a bit more about that while we're doing the React Home lab. Um, so basically, this idea of de novo subnetwork construction and clustering, um, 
we're basically, we have a list of genes, proteins, or transcripts, and we're going to kind of apply that to the network. We're going to identify topologically unlikely configurations. Um, so basically a subset of genes that interact more closely with one another than they would expect, but you know, than other, than each other in the network than you'd expect by chance. You can extract these unlikely configurations and then you can annotate these clusters. So network clustering um, is, this, is basically this process of grouping objects together. You can use the word clusters, communities, and modules. So I'm going to use probably modules and clusters as I'm continuing the talk, but you can understand this. And essentially they consist of elements that are similar in some way or other. So there are a variety of different network clustering algorithms. They were mainly developed in the social end, you know, people that are studying social interactions, engineering. There's the, you know, there's you know large networks within companies and people want to kind of um, collectively organize some of that information in the network and then they obviously want to try and filter out information. That's basically what this, these algorithms are doing, and they're basically there to look for these sets of nodes that are tightly connected with one to, no, to one another. Um, and basically, the idea here, particularly as we know now, is that um, in large networks, it's very useful to identify highly connected genes because they obviously potentially share the same connectivity. Sorry, this is not just the connectivity, but the same similar functionality. So uh, this here is a long list. Or, or, well, not a long okay. list, but a relatively, um, let's say, actually an abridged version. Actually, there, there could be, this slide could be a lot longer there because there's many different network clustering approaches out there. In fact, people that are studying like beehive, like the interactions between bees and how the, the bees swarm around the queen bee, you know, actually there's, you know, there's interactions that you can study there and you can actually, you, there's actually, um, um, network clustering approaches derived from that kind of work. I'm not saying they're going to be applicable here for protein protein interactions, but there's the list of algorithms that really um, can be used for uh, identifying those top topologically un you know, unlikely uh, modules is long. So I've focused on some of the most relevant ones. We're going to learn a bit more about Gervin Newman uh, in the React Home Lab later today. Um, basically, the idea here is that it, it's, you, you have your network. You kind of chip away at the network. So you start removing like the edges where there's the highest betweenness uh, first. And then as you kind of chop away at the graph, you kind of break it down into individual nodes. And as it breaks down further, you kind of see these tightly knit interactions appearing. You'll see it better when we actually, you'll understand it better when I demonstrate it in the lab later. Um, Markov clustering algorithm, again, is a similar kind of approach of like identifying these modules, but it looks at the graph in a slightly different way, and it's using these kind of stochastic flow models. Um, and again, my, my limited, see, I'm trying not to present you with statistics and equations here because I'd lose, I'd lose myself probably in that as well, but it is kind of, um, Basically, I think the take-home message here is there's a variety of different algorithms that are used for network clustering. Um, you know, if you have a gene expression data set, you may want to use Markov clustering algorithm. And in fact, I th think we can actually, we can actually might do that in the lab. Actually, I'll maybe try to do that in the lab if we can. But for typical, you know, gene lists that you have out there, the gervin newman algorithm works really nicely at identifying modules. Hotnet is kind of interesting in the sense um, it uses heat, it kind of uses a heat diffusion model. Uh, it's a slightly different approach, but again, um, it, the, the advantage here is it avoids some of these ascertained bias that is usually associated with well annotated genes. So certainly genes that are well studied, there's going to be lots of interactions and they're going to automatically cluster, you know, when you're into like these nice little tight modules. Uh, when you do the analysis. So you want to kind of avoid certain things like that sometimes because you're not always focused on the genes that you know the most about. You're interested about the rare mutations which are um, that are interacting maybe with one another or some of these driver genes. Uh, there's a hypermodules app which basically helps to find network clusters that correlate with clinical characteristics. So it's important to bring in the idea that you know once you've created your network, 
based on your experimental data, you may want to bring in additional data sets like clinical data to try and relate some of those modules within the network to a phenotype or a clinical outcome. And that's, and that's the whole idea of predicting biomarkers and, you know. So the clinical data come from kind of with what kind of format? Um, well, uh, um, the clinical data really is, um, I mean, we'll do this in the React Home Lab later, and the idea here is the clinical data. So, you know, obviously when the, um, you know, a lot of these kind of large studies, there's clinicians involved, so you kind of, you've got, you've, you're, you know, say you're studying the gene expression profiling of a cancer patient. You also have, you also have, as well as you have the experimental data that you've, you know, you have, you might also have information about survival, survival and whether the patient succumbs to the disease when that is. And you can use that information to actually um, um, make predictions. And actually, the Reactome FI network and the, the actual Cytoscape application that we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to actually show in the lab later, it actually integrates a number of these different algorithms. So depending on the type of data that you want to use, you want to analyze, you've got these different opportunities to analyze the data using this algorithm. And essentially, this is the outcome of the analysis. This is just a, you know, just a, a hypothetical subnetwork. It's composed now of six clusters, um, you know, and oh, this is you know, my slides have been screwed up a little bit. Sorry. The point I want to make here is that, um, you know, you know, this cluster six here has only got two genes. You might exclude that from your analysis and focus more on like these modules here, that are. Here and here, um, and then you also have to remember that it's mutually exclusive, so the gene only appears once in this network. So you know, th there's some analysis you can do where you can have networks where there's more, you know, the same gene can appear in more than one module. This is one gene per, you know, only appears in one module. So this, I'm going to kind of move on a little bit. I'm going to probably, can I have permission to run a like maybe five minutes into the break? Are we okay with that? I'm sorry, I'm. Um, Thanks, Brad. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the React Home Functional Attraction Network. Um, and basically, in fact, I've gone through some of these things here. The point is that we want to basically analyzing mutated genes in a network context allows us to understand the relationship between the genes. So you can elucidate the mechanism of action of the driver, you, take, you know, these driver genes, and the rare mutations as well. You can facilitate some form of hypothesis generation. And most importantly, really, when you've got these large data sets with thousands of genes, maybe tens of thousands of genes, you can reduce that down to a handful of mutated genes and potentially mutated pathways. And that's basically there to generate your hypothesis. You know, that's, that's, that's it's a hypothesis generating tool. Or alternatively, you could use it to validate a hypothesis you already have. You know, you've done experiments to demonstrate, you know, you demonstrate the tool. That, sorry, does it dem dem demonstrate a particular phenotype or... Uh, perturbation of a biological uh, event, and you can basically, you know, potentially go out there, derive experimental data, throw it into the Reactome FI network and into the app, and see if you actually can validate your your hypothesis. So we're going to talk about functional interactions here. Um, so basically, uh, the network, the Reactome FI network, is a functional interaction network. A uh, functional interaction network is an interaction which um, two protein, well, basically it's uh, a reliable biological network based on manually curated pathways and extended with verified interactions. So this is just a typical reaction here, and you can break that reaction, pathway reaction, down to a handful of binary interactions. Okay, now, uh, in order to have a kind of larger network, uh, um, we we basically parsed a lot of data from the pathway data, different pathway uh, data resources, and integrated these other F, the, these other um, protein protein interactions. So we extract these you know the extracted pathway interactions are called the annotated FIs, annotated functional interactions. And then what we can do is for subsets of that data, we can use that as a training data set for a naive Bayesian classifier. 
which you then feed in the features for all these different interactions. And that you know, creates a second data set <coughs> called the predicted FIs. So they're going through all the different protein-protein interaction databases and trying to figure out, okay, here's an interaction. Because we're basing the fact that you can trace a lot of the interactions in the pathway from the, sorry, the interactions derived from the pathway database can all be linked back to um, the literature. And there's been, you know, some, you know, additional um, contributions of authors and reviewers. There's a high degree of certainty that that interaction occurs within the cell. Some of these interactions are derived from high throughput experiments. There may be some that do actually occur within the cell. Some could be, frag, you know, artifacts and such. So the naive Bison classifier tries to identify, you know, the probability that a particular uh, interaction is actually very, is true, that it actually will occur in the cell. So we combine these two data sets and we're left with like a series of uh, 328,000 interactions and uh, consisting of about 12,000 proteins in the cell. So that's about, that's just about 60%, I think, of gene coverage, of the human gene coverage. Okay. Avoiding circularity in this. I mean, are you saying those protein protein interactions are ones that you generated, or are you saying that the like large data sets deposited, which were then mined to make React though, and now you're essentially remining it? No, because a lot of these protein, we don't, when we curate reactome pathways, we're not using protein-protein interaction data from any of these high-throughput databases. Okay. But you could, you could potentially identify within some of these databases interactions that have literature references. So you're going to have a slightly, you know, you know, depending on the experimental approaches people have applied to study those interactions, you're going to decide whether there's a high degree of confidence. So you're that, only annotating reactome based on single-gene experiments, uh, which you, which you're placing as being more high confidence. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Because you've, because, and also you have Reactum and some other pathway databases. There's also a, an, inter, an inter, you know, there's a curator who's building that record of the reaction. But they're also talking to an author, and the author is somebody who's an expert in the field, who's giving you a bit more information, saying, well, I think it's these papers you want to build to to build this this reaction, and then it's reviewed, peer reviewed. So. There's time and effort put into creating these records, so there's a high degree of confidence in the, the individual interactions. But you're essentially guaranteeing then that you have not a priori formed the model yeah. between these two guys. Right. Okay. So yeah, we're trying to keep them, well, that's why we have these two groups, we combine them and then we have this large network. So what I've talked about before is the idea that uh, you're using uh, genes, of, you know, that you're, you're extracting networks from different databases it could be, and you create the network yourself. Now what I'm telling you about here is an alternative way of doing data analysis, and that is, here's the reactome network, and you, why don't you just use that as, an, as your large data set to start with, and then you basically use these clustering algorithms to chip away at that network once you've uploaded your data in there. You identify those modules, and actually I do this better in the next slide here, but just imagine this is like a subset of the network here. Um, now, there's going to be some degrees of connectivity that you'll, you'll see these kind of structures here. Just ignore this. This is just an unweighted network just now. But if you start putting your genes into the data set, into projecting your genes of interest from your data into the network, they're going to map to certain locations in, in the network. They obviously, oh yeah, they obviously, the yellow lines demonstrate that there's some form of interaction between those nodes. And then you can sometimes add these things in called linkers. These help to provide um, a degree of connecti better connectivity between topic topologically distinct locations. You don't have to add in linkers, but sometimes linkers could be things like transcription factors, which may not necessarily be kind of perturbed within your within your gene expression profile, but they help to explain what's going on in your data. So there, you get additional lines, and then you take away everything that's not really part of your data set, and now you're left with a subnetwork based on your data. And now you can do the kind of network analysis. So um, just an example of going back to the 127 cancer genes I was talking about earlier. You can upload that into the Reactome FI network. And then you see that there. And now we've done the clustering. So you can see these distinct modules here. There's four distinct modules. And then using pathway enrichment tools, you can actually label these modules and say, well, this is receptor tyrosine kinase signaling. There's, this is possibly crosstalk between notch, wind, TGF beta signaling, 
Um, there's TP53 module here, and there's a cell cycle module. Again, there's you know you have to look at the, the data sets that you're up, you know uh, you have to look at the the pathway names that you're overlaying because it might not be obvious sometimes that you're talking about the TP53 pathway. It could be uh, a sub pathway of that. But the point is, um, you know, there's there's the statistics to back up these and these particular annotations. But you yourself have to kind of go in and, and, and tease out certainly some of the pathways of interest. Um, this just is an example of where you can combine uh, the results of your experimental data with clinical data. This is kind of getting back to your question earlier. So basically what we're doing here is using the ReactMFI network uh, to display gene expression data and then to search within these modules uh, for Sorry, within the network, we're looking for modules that are related to patient overall patient survival. Okay, so um, basically here you can do there's two different types of survival analysis you can perform. We'll be doing this in the lab. There's Cox proportional hazards, and then Kaplan. This is a Kaplan-Meier uh, approach here. So with the KM, uh, the Kaplan-Meier plots, you basically draw uh, probability of survival um, versus time. So um, basically what happens is um, basically we have uh, sample information associated with all of the gene expression. You know, the gene expression profiling is derived from patients. We know about some physical characteristics of the patient, how they're responding to treatment. So we know basically from the sample, the, the actual patient samples, genes are going to have low expression or high expression. And basically that's what you do. You split the group into uh, two groups. So you're basically going to have samples where there's no or low level of expression. And you know the, that's, the, that's the red line and the green line is where genes are high expression. So basically in this particular case, there's a module of 31 genes that are involved in, uh, in mitotic uh, cell cycle. Um, and the difference in color is just there to represent different annotations from different pathway databases, but essentially it's confirming that it's part of the cell cycle. But you could say that these 31 genes um, is significantly related uh, to breast cancer patient survival in at least five different cases. That's what this kaplan meier plot is showing. Um, the point is, and possibly patients with kind of low expression are faring better than patients with high expression of these genes in this particular module. So the idea here is um, basically that a single, net, or maybe not just a single network module, it could be more than one module, um, could be used as a signature to, um, for the, uh, for the it could be used as a signature uh, for patient, can, you know, cancer patient prognosis. Uh, we'll, we'll do this in the lab. Uh, later today, and actually there's a quite a good data set to demonstrate this. So the last part of my talk, and I do apologize of running over time, but um, this is, so I'll get through this relatively quickly because it's quite painful. Uh, <laughs> this is because this is more about looking at um, pathway modeling. So again, you're still going to have lists of genes, proteins, transcripts. Um, we have preserved a lot of the interactions, the information about the relationship between those entities. And what we're trying to do is integrate multiple data types, so things like copy number variation and somatic mutations, together to actually try and yield not just a list of significant pathways, but a list of altered pathways. And that's, the, well, let's say this has been, a, you know, many groups have tried different approaches. And I kind of made a assertions earlier that um, that uh, you know people work on different types of things. Like they'll focus mostly on metabolic tools, or sorry, um, they, they focus mainly on metabolic pathways. There's also signaling pathways, and for that, there's different tools for different resources. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, you can't necessarily apply all of these tools to your data set. If you've got a metabolic data set, you could probably use something like um, cell, cell Net Analyzer because it, it's there used mostly for um, studying, uh, basically a lot of the, the algorithms have been, have been developed for 
doing what they call computational strain design. So say somebody has a bacterial cell and they want to maximize the production of a particular product from a given pathway. Well, you can do metabolic engineering and such. And so what I'm trying to say is cell net analyzer may not necessarily be applicable to studying signaling networks in a human disease. That's what I'm trying to say. So um, there's no, well, there's only a handful of tools that kind of work with multiple different pathway data sets. Like, and I'll, we'll talk a bit more about one in, in a moment. But there are these different types of um, approaches for studying uh, pathway modeling. Um, whether you're looking at metabolic pathways, whether you're looking at phosphorylation states within cells, whether you're looking at regulatory processes, transcriptional regulation of such. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about paradigm because I think that's actually quite a useful approach to actually looking at different types of pathways. And in particular, it's useful in studying disease data sets. Again, I apologize for focusing primarily on cancer, but it, it's probably one which is actually generating useful multi thing data sets. So probabilistic graph models, in this case, attempts to integrate multiple uh, molecular alterations to yield this list of pathways. As I said, you can have omics data for an individual patient or across multiple patients. So typically, it's copy number variation, gene expression data, and some kind of mutation data. Um, and the approach here to actually use paradigm is as such. Now, we've, we've I've introduced you to basically this kind of a simple view of apoptosis. It's MDM2 inhibits p53. Uh, in order to actually perform paradigm, you need to think about the fact that you're, you're studying multiple simultaneous perturbations on that pathway. And it's not as simple. You have to create a, what we call a factor graph. So basically, um, in this example, a single protein in the pathway now becomes four independent entities, or but related. Uh, so there's genes, transcript, protein, and an active protein in this case. And each has of the pathway, you know, each of the components um, has a piece of experimental data to, that you can you can exploit. Now the next question is: once you take two of those different data sets, whether it's uh, copy number of variation is how did that get integrated into the analysis and displayed in the pathway diagram. So I'm going to go back to the pathway diagram just as an example here. So we have a simple gene expression regulatory pathway where CT, GF, and NAPA are regulated by YAP1, WTR1, and RUNX2. Now, what we're trying to do with this PGM work is to ask the question, if I convert this pathway into a factor graph, I'm not going to show you the factor graph for this individual pathway, just want you to understand just now, is you want to ask questions. Well, if YAP1 copy number is up, how likely is CTGF upregulated? Or if NAPA is, is activity is high, how likely is WTR1 uh, expression upregulated? Or maybe RUNX2 downregulated? Anyway, sorry. So. Um, in this example here, we're using the same diagram. This is using this probabilistic graph modeling view. So on the left panel, you're seeing the pathway for two different patients. Um, so we're combining copy number variation and gene expression data from ovarian cancer samples. Again, this is from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, and we've integrated that into the factor graph um, using this paradigm approach. And basically, once you, what you're viewing here is the inference. The, and so, um, basically, the point I want you to kind of focus in on here is the comparison here is that um, if you look at, uh, actually, sorry, I'm so I'm colorblind, I apologize, I'm red, green, colorblind, which makes it very difficult sometimes when you're looking at slides to, and I can't, because of the projector, uh, you're going to have to, I think, did I annotate this? I didn't. Oh, shoot. The colors are, there is a difference in the colors. The thing is, what I'm seeing on my screen is different from what you're seeing here. The point is, and the problem in your notes are, are they colored? Yeah. yeah. All right. Actually, can I just look? This side. Oh, you're ahead. No, it's, don't start on the lab just yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
you can see that, so the point is, and the reason I'm looking at it here is, is you can see that it's still green, but there's actually a difference in color yeah. here between these two nodes, okay? Um, and so the first sample, basically, you've got lower expression of NAPA1A, and then you've got uh, slightly higher expression here. And it's most likely because WTR1 is, is there's, there's, a, there's actually copy number change. And I am just like there. So you see here, there's two. So that's, this line tells me there's two copies of, C, of WTR1. So the point is, the copy number variation predicts that NAPA1 is being upregulated. So and the it's minus a, and the plus, the minus three and the plus three refers to the copy number or to the expression? This is, I hope that's expression. Or, or actually, um, the thing is, they just that could be the... Because then the lighter green refers to like you know, more negative values. It could actually be the infer it could be the statistic in the ferns. I actually don't think that I, I need to ch I should check that for you. Okay. Anyway, just a wrap up here because and it's and it's probably like um, well paradigms actually the good news is let's focus on the good news. It's always good. Uh, we've integrated the paradigm approach into the React MFI network, uh, so you can do these kind of uh, probabilistic graph models and pathway based simulations using the React MFI network if you decide. Um, it's still work in progress, um, but uh, it's a useful resource if you want to look at, if you have that kind of data, you want to integrate it <laughs> and try to make inferences from uh, perturbing pathways activities. Um, so just the, la the last few slides are basically just listing some of the resources for some of the uh, different pathway databases, the network algorithms. Uh, and some of the modeling approaches. You can go to these websites. Okay, and we're on a coffee break. Again, I'm sorry for overrunning. Is there any more questions? I feel a bit... I'm sure there'll be lots of more questions during the lab. Mm -hmm.